Hi everyone. We are here for our very first episode of this podcast that has doesn't have a name yet. <laughs> um, but we are going to talk about the origins of something. Every episode is going to be um, a story from each of us. I am Kristen, and this is Carla. Say hi. hi. There she is. Say hi. <laughs> <laughs> the, the whole podcast is me just telling you just what to say. Me around. <laughs> now say this. You did it wrong. <laughs> you don't believe that. Okay, I you don't. don't believe that. <laughs> oh my gosh! No, the entire podcast is just going to be us, like joking with each other. <laughs> yeah. No content. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I guess I'll get started. Well, I'll go first. (laughs) Well, of course you would. (laughs) Listen. (laughs) Sassy little (laughs) lassie. Okay, so when we were talking the other day. Wait, should I go stand in the corner? (laughs) Why? What are you talking about? (laughs) What the hell? Did you, I have to have my quiet time now. <laughs> Carly, you shut up now, okay? Yeah, you go can look quiet. at a wall. Okay, no, sorry. Put a dunce cap on. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Just maybe stop moving around so much. I can hear the scratching. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> now I have to stop moving. No. Stop talking. Stop moving. <laughs> I need like a little get holder. Off this call. Yeah, that would be perfect. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my oh my god. god. Get off the stool. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Uh, this is going nowhere fast. <laughs> okay, so when we were talking the other day about like different ideas that we had for the reason why we wanted to start this podcast, um, basically we just wanted an excuse to talk to each other. Uh, but, uh, so I threw out the idea of, like, why is mac and cheese, like, <laughs> the, like, such a pervasive, like, popular go-to thing? Like, why that pasta of all the pastas? Like, <laughs> I just didn't understand why, <laughs> I mean, it's not like I'm giving this a lot of thought, but why that thing of all the <laughs> things? Like, where did it come from? So today I'm going to talk about the origins of mac and cheese as we know Ooh. it today. I'm surprised by this. <laughs> yeah. No way. No, get out. <laughs> um. Mac and cheese? <laughs> no, just one. Just oh. the mac. Okay. Um. So it's when I was looking at kind of the history of it, I guess it's a little bit debated over where the first recipe for macaroni and cheese showed up. Um, really? Some people say that it came from. Italy, and then um, the majority of, of people were saying that it is it first showed up in a British cookbook, <laughs> but it's both around the same times. Um, so at about in about 1390, there's a cheese and pasta casserole known as macarons or macaroons that what? shows up in a medieval English cookbook called the Form of Curie. What? So and and that's considered Britain's earliest cookbook. When so I, they they have a rich history of bland food. <laughs> I know, right? I was really surprised that it came from Britain of all places. Like, really? I found a few <laughs> sites that said Britain, and I was like, that can't be right. I totally discounted it, and but there was only one place that said that it also showed up in a 14th century Italian cookbook called Liber di Cochina. Yeah, with a perfect the 14th Italian century accent. Well, 1390 mm-hmm. is also 14th century, so it's like the same time. Kind of. How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like the U. Like, well, I guess British people. I don't know UK. I don't know. Did they say like specifically? Anyway, I will not get into that. I think they. But I mean, they, have they a live pretty- on beans and toast basically <laughs> and bangers and mash and just the most bland stuff so it kind of makes sense but I that think they would they take have a that pretty, like rich yeah that's true actually over something like like really like right yeah like spicy salami or whatever <laughs> yeah, exactly. just salami <laughs> apparently okay <laughs> 
but I do getting... think, like, I mean, they have a pretty rich history of stealing things from other countries, too. So, yeah. I mean, I think generally you can, um, you can pretty much, like, guarantee that any pasta came from Italy. Oh, I'm going to get in trouble for that, because didn't it start in China? Spaghetti I don't know. Or something? I don't know. Well, I maybe mean, that's for another episode. This just noodles. turns into the pasta. <laughs> like, your podcast. Well, yeah. <laughs> Look. We have to get educated somehow. <laughs> um, what am I saying? Okay. Um, where was I? Okay, so this medieval English cookbook, it was actually a cookbook that was made for um, King Richard II or something by his like head chef. <laughs> well, was it, it or was... wasn't it? <laughs> 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 Don't question me. <laughs> um, but it was it, like I feel like I'm gonna do a future episode about cookbooks because I started going down this rabbit hole of when the first recipes were written down, who was writing them down, because of course at that time a lot of people didn't know how to read or write. So the wait, chef, I have to clear my throat. Okay. So we'll have to awkwardly po- edit this out. <laughs> 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 or just leave it like a jerk. I have such a good book about the history of food and cooking. Oh, really? It's amazing. It goes Ooh, like all the way back, it and it's called? one of the funniest books I've ever read. Um, good question. I'll get back to you on that. Uh, you're gonna say good housekeeping? Like I, feel I don't like know where it wrong. is. It has some kind of name. <laughs> Whatever. Continue because I can't find my book. <laughs> has a name? No. <laughs> I'll, oh, there it is. Um, the history of food in a hundred recipes. Cool. It's so good. <gasps> That's really cool. Yeah. Have you anyway. made, are, are there recipes in there? Yeah. And did you make them? <laughs> Is macaroni and cheese in there? It should be. I should check. Ooh. Mm-hmm. Probably. He probably can't be bothered with such a bland food, but continue. Whatever. Mac and cheese is delicious. You shut up. <laughs> okay, so it shows up in this medieval English cookbook that was done, um, I guess, Richard II was like kind of known as this um, a bit eccentric. He used to have these massive uh, um, feasts and he would spend a ton of money on them. And he would quite often have them serve this like macaroni and cheese dish. So it's kind of like a, this dish is kind of like a mix between lasagna and macaroni and cheese. Like they mm. describe to like layer the pieces of pasta with cheese and butter. It's Parmesan cheese and butter. Hmm. I got very hungry when I was doing the research for this. <laughs> yeah, like, oh. the, the podcast, like, it's like this awkward clip, and then suddenly they just hear chewing. <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so mac and cheese, like, it ended up trickling down from palaces to Europe's aristocratic homes where it was, they in, it was enjoyed, like, in this level of home well into the 18th century. Hmm. So we're in the 1700s now. So basically it was kind of a dish that was for the the higher classes, like the richer people. I think largely because cheese um, was quite expensive. It wasn't available to everybody. Like the low little pilgrims aren't going to be... That's surprising because even in like, you know, uh, where was that? Um, kind of like the Middle Eastern places, they'd have like their goat's milk and like cheese would be so easy to make right but i think when i was actually looking up some stuff cheese can be quite difficult to make on a larger scale so oh, because it can okay. like that you have to get the cultures right and the bacterias and the blah 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 blahs it's um there's a lot of mold yeah. like it can go bad so a lot of cheese makers it they, wouldn't be like the parmesan they waste whole batches like because if something goes wrong with it like the whole thing is thrown out you can't oh. salvage it so it can't it sounded like it was a lot trickier than than so I. so they probably just have like their soft kind of cheeses like farmer's cheese and maybe like, the easy, yeah easy to make ones like because i know in poland they make farmer's cheese and so easy right and but it's a fresh cheese so right. i suppose it's like okay yeah, because cool. a lot of these, for the majority of the first re- recipes, you par- used Parmesan cheese. Parmigiano. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Could we not go down an offensive line? No. Let's do it. We always will. <laughs> um, 
So some historians credit Thomas Jefferson with introducing mac and cheese to the U.S., but <laughs> <Brother. laughs> it's not. Of course. It, yeah, of course. But that's not the thing. It was already there, but he really helped to popularize it because he he became yeah, he obsessed with up, it. I made this. It's all my doing. <laughs> I'm so great. I'm so great. Everybody yes, sir. Anything you say, sir. <laughs> yeah. Um, so apparently he ate it in France while he was there in the 1780s on a diplomatic mm. trip. And then he ended up serving it at a White House dinner in 1802. Okay. Which I just think is so funny that it started out as a really high-end thing. Because yeah. that is not at all what it yeah. ends up being now. Although oh for some gosh, people, like is... it's kind of making a comeback, I guess, in um, in fancier ways and stuff. Like people are adding all the stuff. It's kind of yeah. trendy, you know, hipstery, but... whatever. But for it to start as such a high-class thing that was not something that that the lower people did and now you can buy a box of mac and cheese for like and i think it's synonymous with the cheap easy meal for like Mm -hmm. the lowly masses kind of thing like which i'm a part of but like right that's and so it's going to take a long time to ever it's not ever going to go back to just rich people food i don't think right i don't think so like i don't how could it right and that ever happen the other way i don't know i don't know I don't anyway, what? Okay. Think so. I feel like once you give it to the people, you can't take it back. <laughs> <laughs> no take backs. <laughs> take backs for hoarding the mac and cheese boxes. No, yeah, it's, it's mine. mine. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. So by the mid 1800s, there were more recipes for mac and cheese popping up in various cookbooks across America. Hmm. And with the Industrial Revolution and the factory production of the main ingredients, the dish became more affordable and more accessible. So the first cheese factory in the U.S. was built (laughs) in 1851, and it made cheddar cheese one of the first foods affected by the Industrial Revolution. Hmm. And that's kind of like what I was talking about, where before that, cheese was actually quite difficult to make. Um, like, it was very temp- a very temperamental thing to make. So when they were able to figure out how to do it in the factories, it was like, it blew it up. Like, people were able to actually consume it on a regular basis. I never even thought of that. That's so Isn't cool. Isn't that crazy? I know, I yeah. hadn't thought of that either. It's just cheese kind of... I've. Yeah, I don't think about it. <laughs> because now it's so accessible and all kinds of different cheeses. Like, it's just such a a pervasive food. Like, I, for me, it, we yeah. always have cheese. Particularly in the, the house. like, factory, you know, the black diamond, like the logs yeah. of, che- you know, squares yeah. of cheese. And it's kind of like, oh, yeah, that would have to have gone through its own revolution. It's like, exactly. Oh, yeah. I know. Isn't that crazy? Um, so, as it became more accessible to the broader society, it obviously became less appealing with the upper classes. So, it was already kind of starting <laughs> to make a bit of a shift. <laughs> oh, we can't have that peasant food anymore. They're all crying, looking out the window. I miss my mac and cheese. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, then the next kind of transformation in that is that processed cheese was invented in the early 1900s in Switzerland. What? Um, yeah. No. Isn't that crazy? I would just assume it would have been invented <laughs> in America because America very much took it on as like Well, everything was processed, right? Everything's like processed and T V dinner thing. Yeah. Well and it's like the the um the craft singles yeah. and like all of Velveeta, all of that stuff, you associate it very much with America and American like American cheese, which is not really cheese. How dare you? <laughs> you know, there's a place for craft singles. There really there is. There is, and you know what? I didn't even ever eat one until, I think until at your house when I was like a teenager. My mom what? never, we, I had never had cheese Whiz until at your, I was at your house. I had never had a craft single slice ever. No. My mom never bought that stuff because she was like, that is plastic. That's not cheese. Oh. And she refused. We never had it ever. But she's it had, Dutch though, so it's like yeah. she's gotta have the gouda. Well, we have That's ch- we had cheddar in the house, but because yeah, okay, fine. If people want to say it's no cheese, but like you can't have a grilled cheese sandwich with any other cheese than a Kraft Singles cheese slice because it's not the same. It's not. We already had. We always had cheddar, cheddar cheese in there, and that's not okay. <laughs> <laughs> But that's the thing, though, is that it's like, I think I agree that 
craft singles, they're their own thing. And it's like, they you are. have to be specific about the type of, but the same way with mac but and cheese. But it's a delicious own thing. And people are like, oh, it's so gross. It's just because it isn't ch- oh proper God, cheese. No, and it's, it's kind of so like, good. how dare you? <laughs> oh, remember the sandwich? Remember that sandwich maker machine? And with craft right. singles and mushrooms in it. Mm-hmm. Oh, God, machine sandwiches. So machine sandwiches. But yeah. it's this is kind of an, like a redemptive thing because thinking about like laughing cow cheese, I feel like that's processed. And yeah. that's where did laughing cow start? Um, but yeah, with if the Swiss are doing it, for did it first. Then it makes right? it okay. And in Europe, I know that there's lots of um, like packaged kind of processed cheese they might kill me for saying it but there was right like you go to the yeah. grocery stores it's like the mucals and this and that and they have a little so well i mean the like, industrial like... revolution happened everywhere right so what the, yeah. <laughs> the europeans aren't immune <laughs> <That's so good. laughs> okay so in the early 1900s processed cheese was invented initially it was basically just a really good way to make food for soldiers who were going to war and a good way to get nutrients to people who didn't have refrigeration yet so it was like nutrients you say yeah at the time it wasn't completely plastic yet how dare you (laughs) (laughs) and something i saw recently when i was researching this i think it was with velveeta that they said it's not actually there they can't technically classify it as a cheese because it doesn't have enough of the act the proper elements to it anymore it's so processed <sighs> that doesn't mean that it's bad necessarily it's I just never that liked it's so velveeta. processed i really loved the commercials for velveeta right i always wanted oh, to love it i wanted to love it so badly yeah no i draw Maybe the line at craft singles <laughs> Okay, so it wasn't okay. So we're in the 1900s now, early 1900s. Soldiers, people who didn't have refrigeration, processed cheese is becoming more and more accessible and pervasive. But it wasn't until the Great Depression, so the 1930s, that mac and cheese really made its way into mainstream American culture. Hmm. And it, I'm primarily talking about American culture because I think that America, North America, has really adopted. Um, mac and cheese maybe more than other cultures oh Oh, for sure yeah um so in 1937 Kraft foods introduced Kraft macaroni and cheese dinner wait wait say that again in 1937 Kraft foods what yeah introduced Kraft macaroni and cheese dinner see i've been on this edge of my seat waiting for like the Kraft dinner mac and cheese to appear right yeah 37 yeah what is that earlier or later than yeah thought i thought it'd be? it'd be like 70s earliest. really yeah or 80s even because it's like that powdered orange cheese that like they didn't even have neon orange back in the <laughs> 30s <laughs> continue um yeah and i couldn't find i didn't do like too much of a deep dive into it but i did see that some of the early ones uh um of some of the pre-made ones came with a package of um like squeezable cheese like like yeah that makes sense not the powdered cheese right um but i don't so i don't know exactly when the powdered cheese came into play if it was from the beginning or not i don't know um but they called craft uh macaroni and cheese dinner the housewife's best friend a nourishing one pot meal and it could serve four people for 19 cents so at that time of course in the great depression people were like desperate to feed anything there they couldn't um you know, they needed something that was still good, that still mm-hmm. had some nutrients to it. But that and was back cheap. then, it probably did actually feed four people and make them full. Unlike now, when you eat a whole box and you're like, "There's no way By this yourself. is supposed to." <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah feed like, four how people. would you feed a family? <laughs> There's no even just splitting it with two people. Mm-hmm. You're like, no, it's not quite enough. No. Yeah, I know those bastards. Uh, so in that year alone, so in 1937 alone. 8 million boxes were sold in America. Whoa. Is that crazy? Uh, and then with rationing in effect during World War II, it continued to gain in popularity. Hmm. So I think it just kind of became like a really good um, go-to thing for people. It was really accessible. It was easy and it was cheap. 
<laughs> so apparently, <laughs> this is what I found funny since we were both <laughs> Canadian. Canadians love mac and cheese, and we purchased <laughs> nearly 25% of the 7 million boxes of Kraft Dinner sold worldwide each week. We are a quarter Canadians, That's... and we don't have that big of a population. <laughs> oh my gosh. We're all trash. I know, right? But, Total trash. And when I saw it in certain things, too, they kind of pointed out that in Canada, we call it craft dinner. Oh. But So, which makes me think that in other places, they don't call it craft dinner. So then I'm like, well, what do you call it? I guess yeah, just mac they... and cheese. Oh. Or KD. I don't know. But here we call it craft dinner. Oh. No, but it's like KD. Yeah. For sure. But what it, the Americans don't say craft? I don't know. KD? They specif- like, specifically said in a few places, they singled out Canada. Oh. As they, there they call it craft dinner. Oh. Isn't that crazy? That's. Odd. I thought everyone called it that, but I guess not. Me too. Is that so weird? Oh, I um, guess it would, could just be, yeah, craft macaroni and cheese. Right, yeah, which or maybe they should no say mac and cheese or whatever. Huh. Yeah. I okay. Um, Why is that such a, like, brain, like, melter? I know, right? It freaked me out, too. I think it's that <laughs> thing because when you think that you are, um, you think that that's just the way something is. Yeah. And, and then we you appropriate realize everything that, from the States, right? So it's kind of like, yeah. Well, what? And then I'm like, but they say that in the ads, but the ads were made for Canadian Canada. consumption, yeah. right? Mm. So they they speak our language already. <laughs> <laughs> they speak my language. <laughs> um, so I did find <clears throat> I didn't really like delve into it too deeply, although I fa- did find it very interesting that um, in America, in America specifically, there's a lot of because it's considered mac and cheese is considered uh, soul food and like a real comfort food for the African American population. Mm-hmm. Like they've really, it's a big thing for them. Um, like modern mac and cheese, or do you think that they had their own version way back? Well, that's the thing. Like you could even delve into the history of it just with within that culture. Yeah. So kind of where people were talking about is that like when it was still back in say like the 1800s and it was really popular still with the upper classes like late 1700s early 1800s yeah if you think about it like especially down in the south people call it like the antebellum south in the states Mm -hmm. where they had the plantations and all that stuff who was it that was cooking for the rich white people it was the black slaves were cooking for them. So yeah. even for Thomas Jefferson, um, his chef was a black man, and it's said that his the way his version of mac and cheese was Thomas Jefferson's favorite. Like, okay, <clears throat> the twists and whatever that he did with it were his favorite, and so they say it was that just it, um like rat poison. <laughs> yeah, exactly. For flavor. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, here, sir. Have some more. (laughs) (laughs) That'd be awesome. (laughs) But it was interesting because, yeah, they were saying, basically, if you think about it, the people who knew how to cook it were the black slaves. While they didn't eat it, there aren't that many reports of them eating it, like, in the slave houses and stuff like that, um, because they didn't, largely didn't have access to cheese. They they eventually it once once they kind of got their freedom. I think it became a thing that they adopted as a food that they quite often have it now at celebrations. Like it's kind of like a special food for them hmm. to have during special occasions. You know, sorry to interrupt, but um, it's just a little side thing. Is like um, the idea that like you know how when you worked at the well, when somebody works at like a chocolate factory they just mm-hmm. never want to look at chocolate or smell yeah. chocolate again yeah when and, I worked at that cake factory that's what it was yeah 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 and just thinking about like these cooks if they were like if they wanted to eat it themselves or if they wished that they could feed it right like yeah. make it at home or if they actually like, craved it when they went home or if it was that thing of like, if they did have the ingredients all of a sudden, if they'd be like, ew, gross, this reminds me of stupid, like, 
whitey. <laughs> right. <laughs> and but I don't I, want to eat this. I think you could go the opposite way too, where it's like it, if you if it was you um, made for special occasions. Like, I don't think they made it every single day. Like, now for us, it's like oh, a cheap right. every single day meal. Yeah, good point. But for the rich people, it was at fancy, like, dinners Yeah, good point. It's not like they had a, like, a mac and cheese factory in the backyard. Good point. Yeah. So I think mm. that it it might have, um, it might have kind of been in their minds, oh, this is a really fancy this meal. Is, yeah, that makes gonna sense. We're going to do yeah. it for celebrations. Because when I was kind of looking into it a little bit, in the black culture, they they it's one of the key foods that they have at celebration dinners, like and special occasions, which I don't surprised know me. Why? Yeah, I wouldn't think of that. But I love that because, like, I I don't know. I just really liked learning that they have a very different association with it, and a lot of um, like because for me, when I think of mac and cheese, I think of poor people because that's what we ate when I was mm-hmm. young and we did not have a lot of money yeah and I remember sitting when I was I'd come home for lunch and my mom would make mac and cheese and I'd sit with my little bowl of mac and cheese and she'd always put a few pieces of salami on the side and then a couple <laughs> of pickles on the side and she's like it's a full meal <laughs> you've Aww. got protein and you got some vegetables I'm like mm. <laughs> not quite but well it's better than those so stinky- good cabbage I had to eat at lunch and then go to school and like, here's smelly shut up <laughs> oh we really touched a nerve for Carla Look. <laughs> immigrant food <laughs> we'll get into that someday I, I know right but that's kind of what made me think of where it's like you know we all have certain things that become like our comfort food or our food that signifies a certain thing like for me mac and cheese like craft dinner is a comfort food Mm-hmm. Even though it's, like, cheap and it's associated, like, in my mind, it's associated with poverty in a way. And, mm-hmm. you know, busy single parent families with that they're just trying to, like, put a warm meal on the on the table type thing. Yeah. So for me, thinking that people had it as a celebration dinner, that at some point it was only for rich people, it was just kind of an interesting spin on it. And for me, I... Ha- it, that's one of the foods that my mom would never, ever, 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 ever buy. Like, there's no way. And yeah. so it became, it was, what would you call that? Um, not a novelty, but like, it's like this forbidden food, right? And so yeah. when I finally did get to have it, it was just that thing of like, oh, this is so exciting. I get to have like <laughs> what the commercials have been showing me and all the kids are eating it. And it's just yeah. this like exciting thing. And then, it, so like, I want to love it. I eat it. And I'm like, I wish I hadn't eaten that. <laughs> Like, at the time, like, eating it, I enjoy it. But immediately after, it's gross tasting. <laughs> like, yeah. it's, like, the gross after. I don't know. Yeah. I don't... And it's not satisfying. And it's, like, so I have a totally different kind of reaction to mac and cheese. So even now, with proper, um, like, mac and cheese, you know, like, pasta and, like, the gooey cheeses. Like, you make your own sauce, that kind of thing. Yeah. It's always disappointing, too. I have no... <laughs> like, I always want it to be better because there is such a lore. There's such a, like, it's supposed to be comforting. It's supposed to be the tastiest thing. Yeah. And be all fabulous. And I just kind of am always disappointed by it. Even the You know, it's interesting because I find that... I find I'm kind of the same way. It really has to be a very specific... Done in a specific way for it to be good. I mean, I'll, I love my craft dinner... Only it has to be done with one percent milk, not two percent milk. <laughs> <laughs> How but can I it be to, done a specific I, way <laughs> for mac and cheese, craft yes. dinner? Because yeah. you have to like, you can't make it too runny. You can't make it not runny enough. Some okay. people add other right. stuff. You're like right. you can add back, your yes. own cheese to it if you want Ew. to. I know I don't do that, but I always have to eat it with pickles on the side. Yeah, okay. or you can put ketchup on it. That's really good. Yeah, Katie, I enjoy ketchup. ketchup. But anyway, like even like good proper, not from a box mac and cheese. Mm. I find it a little bit flavorless, and I wish that people yeah. would make it a bit more punchy. That being said, if anybody wants to send me free mac and cheese to prove me wrong <laughs> that their mac and cheese is delicious, <laughs> feel free. Do you want that people sending amazing. you food in the mail? I don't Maybe. know. 
Mac and cheese. (laughs) Depends on how hungry I am. (laughs) 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 All right. That's the story of where mac and cheese came from. That's amazing. And why we eat it now. And how why we eat it now? <laughs> yeah, why? I eat it because it's good. It's not good, though. Because I'm hungry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what are you up to this week? What's your um, thing? Okay, it's sort of like, okay, my original thought, I was walking along and I thought, oh, I'm not in a particular, like, I'm not nerdy or geeky enough to fit into those groups. Like, if there's, like, like LARP group live action role play or like a Star Wars fan thing or some kind of like meetup for something like comic book thing. I hate, I'm not, yeah. you know, I don't ever go far enough into it, but then I was walking and thinking like, but I am, I know a lot of nerdy things. Like I was listening to, um, like I have the theme song of what we do in the shadows like downloaded right like I was yeah. just listening to that on my walk and I'm like that's a pretty nerdy thing to do like <laughs> sure is some jock isn't gonna be like you know <laughs> listening to the theme song like well you know and I have Star Wars on there and I'm like so I do a lot of nerdy dorky things and I think I would be classified as a geek or dork just even like from you know because I have glasses and I look a little dorky so it's like but I never really fit into those groups anyway right mm-hmm. so I'm like okay that's interesting and so then that thought made me wonder like okay well who were the first geeks who were like the first people who were actually like how far back does it go where you have the nerdy little you know like well not glasses wearing (laughs) egyptian times they have like little (laughs) sand glasses little hieroglyphs (laughs) little glasses he's a nerd them shoving him into a locker (laughs) a tomb i also wonder why the immediate association with like geeks or nerds is that they're being bullied right okay so Does it, do they have to be bullied in order to be a geek or a nerd i guess you're gonna answer those questions yeah you better <laughs> okay no pressure it kind of it's this meandering thing i don't have like a clear like okay. yours is so wonderfully prepared mine's gonna be a big flat pile yeah, of garbage whatever, it's gonna be great. okay <laughs> a flat pile of garbage everybody <laughs> <laughs> She's got a way with words, people. <laughs> and all the nerds or geeks are like, pile like, can't be flat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I'm punching them. <laughs> Shut up, Poindexter. <laughs> okay, so uh, oh let's see. Okay, God. so nerd and geek have similar etymologies. Okay, that's great. Um, according to this guy, the word <laughs> nerd first appeared in the Dr. Seuss book, If I Ran the Zoo, oh. in which one of the zoo creatures an angry little old man was called a nerd. So this was like in the 50s, I think. Oh my gosh. And uh, where's geek? Geek was originally an early 20th century term for a carnival worker who was so unskilled that the only thing the worker could do at the carnival to entice an audience was to bite off the heads of live animals. What? What? <laughs> yeah. So that went dark fast. <laughs> Essentially. Oh my god, and that's very specific. <laughs> yeah. And not at all what, where I thought that word would I come know. from. It's Ozzy Osbourne. No, but <laughs> essentially. <laughs> Oh my God. Essentially, a geek was a socially undesirable person who lacked any skill or ability. <laughs> Except for. Okay. Okay, yeah. So both terms still retain their original. Oh, this is from, I think, just Britannica.com. Yeah, that's what oh, I Oh, I didn't say any resources. That's okay. We can add them later. Both terms still retain their original connotations of undesirable social traits and behaviors, but in the late 20th century, their meanings became more fluid in nature, with the two terms often considered interchangeable. Okay. So for a while, they were kind of like just both the same. So it's going into the actual, like, term. Yeah. And so I was like, well, that's crazy and interesting like with the whole um so i was looking at actual words like the uh, what's that called like the history is it the etymology what would you call it that like i think so yeah how like where the actual words come from in history right so it says here the word itself geek came from the word geck like g-e-c-k which was originally a low german word which meant someone who is a fool a freak or simpleton <sighs> 
back. Cool. So Whoa. it does go back. Um, it says here the first documented case of geek, the, word, the term geek, mm -hmm. dates all the way back to 1916. So that's where the... Okay, the uh, carny. Sir, kind of. Yeah, the circus yeah. performers were biting the heads off of animals and that kind of thing. Um, for nerd... Uh, what was that? Well, hold on, give me a second. Okay, right here. Um, there are two popular theories as to where the word came from. Uh, the first is that it was perhaps derived from drunk spelled backwards, which would be K-N-U-R-D, like nerd. Uh. This was fitting to describe people who studied instead of going out with friends and partying. So backwards of drunk, right? Okay. A somewhat more popular theory suggests that it came from a modification of uh, nut, like, you know, He's a nut, specifically yeah. N-E-R-T, nerd, which meant stupid or crazy person, and was common in the 1940s, directly before the term nerd showed up. Oh. Then the word nerd ended up becoming fairly popular in the 60s and 70s. And yeah, so I was like, okay, I still want to go back. So I was like, what else? Like, what other word is there? And there's like egghead. Right. Yeah. And oh, just going back. Um. So there's, I found this like little this geek timeline from this like blog, The Evolution of Geek. Fifteen tens German word used to describe a fool or a simpleton. There was like a word. Seventeen hundreds Gecken referred to freaks in some circus sideshows in Austria Hungary. So it's like it goes all the way back oh like to fifteen hundreds. The word, different meanings, right? Eighties um, obviously turned into like um, like both nerd and geek. People would use it for uh, peers who lacked social graces but were obsessed with new technology and computers. So I think that's where the modern. Oh, because I was going to say, I'm like, at some point it needs to turn around to be, because both of those terms, mm -hmm. all the connotations previously were that they're inept and like right. dumb, basically. But now and, it's yeah. like geeks and nerds, it's associated with someone I think who's people, smart. Well, they're but trying maybe to have put a positive. Social. Yeah, they're trying to reclaim. There's a whole movement, and I think that oh, could be okay. a whole other topic, like conversation too, yeah. of the, the how it's changing in the modern times. Because I did some research on that too, of like, okay, well, what is a geek technically, and what is yeah. a nerd technically, and yeah. you know, because um, yeah, like one special, like tends to specialize in stuff, and they're part of a community, and then like one is a little more negative still, and blah blah blah. Anyway, but going back to like going back in time. I was like, okay, um, I found this thing. An obsession with intellectual pursuits is what, someone said this, is what I would consider a true nerd to be. Not necessarily someone with poor social skills or bad hygiene. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody on Reddit. I was like, okay. And then people are like, okay, well, who were the first nerds back then? And someone said, well, it's probably, it would be the people who had access to education. The people who had access to books and literature and knowledge, right? Like that kind of yeah. thing, because they would tend to get into like that, you know, um, obsessive, like classic, how we, like the dweeby person. And I do mean like, I want to know like the bullied dweeby stereotype. Yeah, where they're <laughs> like, like, like focused they, on something. So yeah, they're what they look go like and party and, and yeah. do whatever they're like, no, I'm learning about this. Yeah, so I was like, okay, so it's gonna be somebody like, you know, super educated but then I was thinking okay you have like say the high society people right mm -hmm. you have Jeff the businessman or whatever he's going to take over his dad's thing and his dorky brother Jason <laughs> <laughs> Jeff and Jason uh, sure Cla yeah and I'm thinking British arist like aristocrats yet <laughs> real historical name <laughs> Jeff and Jason <laughs> and so Sir like, Jason yeah, and like you even see it in like um, what was that was that Pride and Prejudice the one the you know with the sisters oh, there's like 50 sisters and then one of them is like she has glasses and she's a little bit like oh yeah right and so yeah. it, they existed in the higher things right but mm -hmm. and so they were teased, I'm guessing. But that's a funny thing. Because if they're educated and knowledgeable, it's kind of like... It's like <laughs> a pursuit of, like, that knowledge is always insufferable to... And I guess the, the bully thing has to be completely connected. Because, right? Like... 
But the point I think is, if you look at, like, if you t- take Pride and Prejudice as an example, they're, yes. especially for women, like, they're, I, I mean, also men, the whole thing was living in society and doing the proper societal things and going for teas and luncheons and finding a mate and having babies and whatever. Yeah. And if being studious and interested in intellectual pursuits doesn't allow you to do that to the same level like if you're not as good at social interaction or it's not a priority for you it's I think it's kind of the same now where it's like you get the people that are going to the clubs all the time like all they want to do is go out and socialize with people and you're like yeah but what do you even talk about you know like (laughs) it's not and then you've got the people that would rather you know play a board game or sit at home and like delve deep into like fan fiction or Mm -hmm watching like a tv series or movies and writing about it or whatever it is right yeah like back then i think because that social thing was such like it was your whole life right your social status was everything and just thinking like yeah i mean so yeah it seems obvious right like where it's Mm. like so the more i looked into it it's kind of like yeah of course there always would have been bullies and the meek kind of dweeby person who's like Aristotle teach me things and Aristotle's like oh Thomas leave me alone like I don't even <laughs> like I can't with I you right time now for you. <laughs> you right because Thomas is just too much and it's like <laughs> 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 don't you love my history it's like <laughs> it's great <laughs> Thomas yet okay but a little interesting side thing okay there's two things um I looked up the word bully because I was curious about the history of bullies yeah. too um, it was for, the word bully was first used in the 1530s, meaning sweetheart. What? Mm-hmm. Applied to either sex from the Dutch bull, which is lover, comma, brother. Okay. Supposedly. Probably diminutive of middle high German bull or brother. Um, the, meeting, the meaning deteriorated, I say, through the <laughs> fif- 17th century. <laughs> through fine fellow blusterer to harasser of the weak. I love that. Fine fellow to, and then harasser of the week in the same sentence. Like, yeah, breath. Yeah. It's like, okay. Classic. Um, this may seem, have been, sorry, this may have been as a connecting sense between lover and ruffian as in protector of a prostitute, <laughs> which was one sense of a bully. Okay, Wikipedia, whoever wrote this is like, <laughs> not clear at all. So the Maybe verb to bully. bully yeah the verb to bully is first attested in 1710 which i think is crazy because there must have been bullying like say back in sparta right there was probably a weak soldier guy kid who's like just running and like relegated to getting sharpening you know who's the spartan (laughs) achilles (laughs) Gregory, they <laughs> Gregory the Spartan. I was thinking of uh, what we do in the shadows, just like that. Her <laughs> it was Gregor and Jeff or Jesk. Anyway, <laughs> right? Like there had to have been just even within the army, there was like the weaker person where they all razzed and like you know, of course, bullied. I think so it's like how can the word bully not been... exist back then? <laughs> yeah, I wonder <laughs> like, what they so called it up. before then, right? They had to have called it something. Or maybe it's just like it. like he, they were doing him a service of like trying to teach him the ways. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. <laughs> so they were called mentors back in the day. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Problem yes. solved. Exactly. Um, one person, and just this kind of another random side note. Um, someone named Flopsy on Reddit. They said about um, like kind of the idea you know, the more positive um, idea of, like, our definition of geek or nerd. They said, I bet they were the ones finding the best spot to pick mushrooms. Is that how we get mushrooms? Making the mm-hmm. small incremental improvements to the farming techniques of the day, which over time created regional differences, or coming up with folk remedies with mixed results because nerds make mistakes too. And I was like, oh, yeah, those people who, like, would fine-tune and, like... Right, like yeah, technical where they're gonna like mm-hmm. advance things. They're gonna spend their time, yeah, like experimenting and figuring out things rather than spending their time getting drunk all the time. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, 
but then there were a lot of them who were socially apt yeah. and could do lectures at the like you know mm-hmm. uh, universities and teach others and um get funding for all their projects and whatnot right like they're actually usually they probably were like aristocrats anyway right so it's like I don't know. Anyway, yeah, so kind of like went nowhere fast, but I thought there were a few good tidbits in there. I love that. Like, I mean, biting animals' heads off, like, that's could just crazy. stop there and be happy. I right? love that that's like the origin of those words. Yeah. Because that's very specific. And it's so I, specific. So now when I say geek, I'm going to be like, oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's taken on such a like thing now that it's almost I think now it's taking a turn for being a really positive thing oh for sure like where people almost take it on as a, a like a look and a vibe of like yeah who they want to be right yeah it's less uh well I guess I'm not in school anymore so I guess that's kind of hard to say I'm sure in school they have the like the but I wonder if really? kids are made fun of based a lot, like in based on the same lines that the classic bully geek lines were. You know, like the jock versus the smart nerdy kid. It has to happen. You know, because bullies need like what they perceive. But I wonder if that's like. Weaker. But I wonder if it's the same thing, or if if they just pick on the poor kid, or if they pick on the kid who's bad at social media. <laughs> you know, like. Or if it's still the same as they just pick on the smart kid. You know, I wonder if it's almost like this weird, like, democratic thing now. Because thinking about social media, if you, even if you were, like, popular or something, if you did, like, a really cringy video, right? You might be mercilessly, like, made fun of. And I don't know. Yeah, that's a really good question. (laughs) I'm going to go undercover at the local high school. I know. I would love, I would watch that show. (laughs) And I'm just in a locker the whole time because I'm just mercilessly bullied by everybody. So obviously an older person. Yeah. You're not geeky enough or smart enough or popular enough. You don't even know what social media is, you idiot. So it's just like all episodes of me crying in the dark. Oh my god, that was awesome. Yeah, that Yay. is. What the hell are they? Now I'm going to be wondering. <laughs> Why? Because body positivity is a thing now, so good luck bullying the fat kids because, you know, yeah, someone's going to defend them. Well, it's, yeah, them. It's, it's just Wonderful. interesting. Like, I wonder who it is if it's just people who don't have very good social skills so they can't, they don't <laughs> I like how we can't let the idea that they don't exist <laughs> like be a thing like we just think it's completely impossible there's always going to be bullies we're like well, no of course there's there but the because that's human nature like i think that's it comes from us being insecure and fearful so we want to make <laughs> so sure that there's kids someone working lower on than us bullying right? posters right now just stop okay yeah cut it out it's not happening it's not happening well it's yeah. true though i mean like that it's how it's the social structure of humans like there has to be some hierarchy there has to be somebody who's better and somebody who's worse (laughs) but what if there like isn't someday that's like the most crazy thing i don't know if it's possible but it's funny that my brain won't even let me think that that's possible like yeah i I just i have no faith in humanity basically (laughs) <laughs> very true. Like, <laughs> I'm, I'm very. Don't cynical. you think we'll all just get really tired? Just so tired that we'll all just yeah. give up on Let's everything. Let's all just have a really long nap. How about? <laughs> Change That's is where impossible. I'm heading right after this <laughs> yeah. phone call. I'm gonna go eat some mac and cheese. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have mac and cheese? I don't. Oh. But I might have to go to the store and get some. Okay, and I'm gonna go bully some kids on the street. (laughs) Amazing. (laughs) 
All right. Yay. Awesome. All right. Talk to you guys next week, and you can see what crazy stuff we're going to come up with. should be interesting. Hmm. <laughs> Carl was not convinced. <laughs> All right. Bye, guys. <laughs>